Habakkuk has a it has a, place, a special place in my heart. Um, so I'm excited to, to look over it with you guys. Um, so I think Habakkuk is, I don't know, maybe I'm biased because it is, I love this book so much. Um, I feel like Habakkuk is more, one of the more well-read books of the Minor Prophets. I feel like people know at least, you know, that Habakkuk is a Minor Prophet. Um, some people might not even know, like, name him as a, <laughs> as a Minor Prophet or, or something like that. Um, so, and, and Habakkuk, uh, and you know, as, as unique as it is, and we'll talk about that too, um, it has a lot of the same um, themes and motifs that we've been looking at. So uh, it's, it's going to be a, really a breeze. Um, and we're not going to have to like go into too much detail about all these different uh, you know, things. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll make references to perhaps like other books where we've seen you know, uh, these kind of things. Um, but Habakkuk is really unique, much like some of the other uh, minor prophets that we've seen. Um, Habakkuk is, is unique in the sense that it was written, well, it, it, it is a, a conversation. It's a conversation between Habakkuk and God. Right? And Habakkuk is not, he's not accusing a group of people. He's not accusing Israel of some sin. Um, it's not like God speaking to Habakkuk to, to speak to like a nation or Israel. It's not like that. It's, it's really just a very personal prayer by Habakkuk, uh, talking to God and bringing some, some very personal struggles that he is having uh, or he was having with coming to terms with you know the suffering and the evil and injustice that was surrounding him at the time and asking God the question, why do you let this kind of, let, let these kinds of things happen? And and I feel like sometimes we as Christians uh, we've been taught you know this traditional um, Southern Christianity where you ought not to ever question God and you know all that kind of stuff. You should you should never ask God you know why is there suffering? Why is there evil? Uh, but as I study the Bible and as I as I mature in, in, in my faith, uh, I find that to be contrary. Um, as I read, I see many people like David, like uh, Jeremiah, people in the Bible who we, you know, uh, I guess kind of put up on a pedestal as, as examples of faith. They had times of low where they were in a valley and they asked God, hey, God, why? You know, why me? Or why is this happening? Why is there suffering? Why are there injustice? Why is there evil around me? And, um, and I, I, I preached a, a lesson that one Sunday morning on uh, Jeremiah. God's answer, God's response to those kind of difficult and complicated questions is not punishment. It's not uh, rebuke. It's actually more love, more understanding. Uh, in fact, he uh, he lets he many times he lets them into a, a little glimpse of the future of hope. He lets them see, hey. I, this is not just happening by random. There is my hand in all of this. And, and and he encourages them, and he walks them through those complicated feelings that they may have while they are exposed to hardships and things like that. And I think Habakkuk is, is a wonderful book because of that reason. It is It encapsulates that relationship between God and man, uh, one that is not just about blind faith or just, you know, just blind obedience, but one that, a relationship that allows for something like this kind of conversation to be allowed and to be had, and it'd be okay, right? Um, how would you feel, you know, if you're a child and then, you know, you, you ask your parents uh, something about this difficult emotion that you have in your heart, and your response that you get, and the response that you get from, from your parents is punishment and rebuke. That would be terrible. God is not like that. God is a loving Father, and God is one that understands that sometimes we don't see the bigger picture. That's just the reality. We are not perfect. We don't have uh, all the information that, that we can have as God does. So God understands that, and he, he, is, he is willing to work us through all of that if, uh, like we talked about with Jeremiah, if we are willing to open up to him and to be transparent 
uh, ourselves with that. So uh, again, I love I love this book, and and it's um, it's a very unique book in, in that in that sense. It's not your your traditional just a prophet or a man of God speaks to like a nation or Israel uh, on behalf of God. It's a personal. It's a deep conversation between uh, someone who loves God but is confused and wants to understand, and God who is willing to explain and to understand the plight of that imperfect human. Um, and this book was written during the, well, Habakkuk himself was around during the final decades of the southern kingdom of Judah um, amidst the rising power of Babylon. So that was a looming threat. And all these prophecies and warnings about this coming exile and captivity, the day of the Lord, right, as we have talked about many, many times, that was quickly becoming a very apparent reality. And, and Habakkuk, seeing all of this happen, looking at all these things coming into uh, place, that's the occasion for this book. Habakkuk asks God um, these difficult questions. And... Uh, yeah, and like we talked about, the book doesn't even address Israel really specifically. Um, it doesn't even accuse anyone of any sin, right? Well, it, it'll talk about some things uh, uh, indirectly, but it's not like Habakkuk is directly, or God is directly accusing or directing a message to a certain party. Um, one thing to uh, keep in mind as we read Habakkuk, and as you read it, you will you will uh, kind of get the feeling that it is so. Habakkuk, it can be character, categorized, sorry, as um, a, somewhat like a poem of lament. Um, it's something that we see in the Psalms. Um, and it's important that we know the style that this is and that kind of style in order for us to properly understand what's happening in the book. Um, in this style specifically, it's characterized by an author addressing God with some kind of a complaint or he comes to God with something um, that's in his heart and he seeks, he seeks God's attention and response on those things. It's almost like a, uh, a prayer of entreaty, right? asking God to act on something that he or she has seen happen that they're not satisfied with. right? And um, yeah, Psalm 44 is a, a great example of a, uh, a lament. Um, Habakkuk's importance lies in the fact that a prophet of God, right, someone who is a man of God, is struggling with these issues, right? Um, much like how we talked about with Jeremiah, uh, we oftentimes think, you know, these great men of God, great women of God, people in the Old Testament, people in the New Testament, who did all these great feats of uh, faith and, and miraculous things, we think that, you know, they didn't struggle with these things, these little things that we consider little uh, of faith, but they did. Right? They were human, and they lived in their own, you know, in their own respect, uh, context of hardship and, and, and persecution, and difficulties. Um, we are not new to that, or we're not the only ones who, who struggle with those things. All these people did. And I think it's important that we see these kinds of uh, quote unquote flaws or faults, right, in these people because it lets us know that it is okay, right, for us to have those questions. Um, not doubt God, but ask God those questions when they arise in our hearts. Um, don't hide them and, you know, sweep them under a rug, but ask God and, and pose those questions, and God will give us the wisdom uh, to work through all of that. So let's go ahead and read Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk can be outlined largely um, in two sections. Uh, the first section would be uh, chapters 1 through the first little section of chapter 2, and then the second section being the five woes, uh, in the second sec second little place of uh, chapter 2, um, well I guess three sections, because uh, chapter 3 we see Habakkuk's prayer, and, uh, and that's a different 
um, section there. So let's just go ahead and dive in. It's not a long book, again. We're running out of short books, so <laughs> we're going to soon have to uh, buckle up for some longer ones, like who's <laughs> um, Who wants to read? Can someone read chapter 1, verses 2 through, or uh, 1 through 4, please? burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear, even cry out to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you show me iniquity, and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me, there is strife, and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. So this is where we kind of can use um, our vast knowledge of the minor prophets that we have accumulated over this uh, quarter is, um, I just, <laughs> uh, again, this reality of when a nation like Israel, when Israel uh, deviates from God, you have all these things, you have symptoms, uh, injustice, uh, you have corruption, you have uh false doctrine uh, with coupled with idolatry and all these different things that happen when you deviate from God. And Baco very quickly, I mean, starting off very strongly, he asks God, why, aren't you, why are you not doing anything about this? You know, we have all these things happening, why are you just sitting there and not doing anything? Um, harsh words, uh, bold words. Um, I mean, we are talking about someone who is talking directly to the Father, um, but it's not, it doesn't, again, it doesn't come from a place of doubt, and it doesn't come from a place of uh, contempt, but Habakkuk is just that hurt, right? He is so confused, and he is just in that point of life where he is seeing all these realities, and he just can't help but ask, why God, you know? Um, you can kind of see that in the first First little bit in verse 2. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Right? Have we ever felt like that sometimes? We cry, we, we pray to God for something to happen, for, for Him to give us relief in a certain situation that might not be very uh, pleasant and, and we don't get the answer that we think we need or we think we want. Um, and if that prolongs, it kind of builds up, right, inside. And I feel like that's what Banco gives experiencing here. And also, as we talked about, we're seeing the rise of Babylon. Babylon was a cruel, cruel empire. And their, the captivity that uh, Israel will experience is not one that's very fun, right? And Habakkuk, seeing this rise of Babylon's power, it's scary, right? It's not, it is no joke. So, I don't know if we can really blame Habakkuk for having these uh, questions in his heart. Um, and this really sets the tone up for the rest of the book, Habakkuk's first complaint. Um, again, Torah is neglected, violence, injustice, corrupt leadership. These are all things that we have seen in the past in other books. Um, it's just the reality when, when people deviate from God, you get these things. Um, and here's first, God's first response uh, to Habakkuk's complaint. Uh, can someone read verses 5 through 11, please? Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work the work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told to you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their forces also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings, and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold. 
for they heap up earth in mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing his power to his God. Okay, so the Chaldeans are really a more they grow to be the Babylonian Empire later on. These are uh, more focused, uh, uh, categorized people, um, but they are, they will become the uh, Babylonian Empire. Um, and like we, I mean, God says it right here, they are dreaded and they are fearsome. Uh, their reputation goes far beyond their borders, and it is very well known already that they are they're cruel and they will conquer <laughs> and uh, that is the reality that is that is kind of knocking on the door of Israel um, and reason for Habakkuk's uh, plea to God um, asking him what is happening you know, why, why are you not doing anything and God's here saying I am raising up a nation and why is that punishment punishment you, you people have not listened to my warnings for how many years, how many centuries, and here we are. The reality is knocking at your door. God's not going to lie. He's not going. He's, when he says he's going to do something, he does it. He will. Right? It might take years, but he will do it. And here we are in Habakkuk's day. Uh, we are seeing the final decades of the kingdom of Judah as this nation that is cruel and, and, and is a conquering nation uh, is growing in power and, and it's, it's about to really come for uh, Israel or the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, yeah, so that, that's, really, that's really the point and, and that's God's response to Habakkuk's first complaint, which doesn't really seem like a <laughs> a response to Habakkuk saying, God, these terrible things are happening. And God says, hey, guess what? I'm raising up a nation that's going to just wipe you out. Um, and we'll see uh, Habakkuk's second complaint. Um, so I'm going to read chapter, or sorry, uh, verse 12 through the first verse of chapter 2. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge. And you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up? Those more righteous than they. Why have you made men like the fish of the sea? like creeping things without a ruler over them. The Chaldeans bring all of them up with a hook, drag them away with a net, and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they offer a sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their fishing net, because through these things their catch is large and their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slay nations without sparing? I will stand on my guard, on my guard post, and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I will reply when I am reproved. So Habakkuk asks a valid question. Why do, why are you letting an evil entity deal treacherously with righteous people or people that are more righteous than them. So yeah, there's the catch, right? Uh, Habakkuk's kind of bargaining with this whole, hey, we're more righteous than the Babylon or the, the Ch Chaldeans, so why are you letting them do this to But in his confusion and in his uh, grief he is forgetting the fact that that still doesn't change the, the reality that Israelites did not obey God. Yes, he may be technically correct that they are more more righteous than Babylonians or, uh, Babylonians or, or Chaldeans. But God is using the, the Babylonian Empire. God is using the Chaldeans in order to punish, in order to fulfill 
the, the day of the Lord, the judgment that he has promised to Israel, God has always, God had always given them a second chance, right? Up to this point, he has, gave, he has given them a, a chance to repent and come back to him, and they have, they have forsaken God, even still. And now, as violence and injustice flares up, and as, as this powerful nation uh, is growing, and they are under this threat, now people like Habakkuk is saying, Hey God, why are you letting you know these evil nations just run rampant? While that is a valid question, I feel like he's kind of bargaining here, right? He's kind of bargaining. You know, uh, there's also God doesn't address this with Habakkuk when he responds, but there's also kind of the possibility that even though Judah is more righteous than the, the Babylonians. God can also be holding them to a higher standard because of what they've been given. I mean, can you really expect any better of the Babylonians? They've never had the word of the Lord. But Judah did. And so, in a sense, their transgression could be worse when viewed that way. That's interesting you mentioned that because what were the Israelites supposed to be to the nations? A beacon. A beacon. They were supposed to be the examples for their, the surrounding nations. In fact, God, when God promised Abraham in Genesis to and blessed him and promised him this, this this nation that will come from his seed, he said that he would make his nation a blessing to those around him. So when God chose Israel, it wasn't just to give Israel this favored position. It was so that the Israelites would obey God and in turn be blessing to other nations and hopefully those other nations will obey God through Israel they were supposed to be the examples right and it's the same concept that we have today with Christians we are supposed to be an example to the surrounding nations or the people that are lost out in the world that we encounter every day this was not Israel was not an exception to that rule right so maybe there is something to be said about a rise in a terrible and cruel and uh, su such an immoral nation is uh, how much responsibility does people of Israel bear in that when they were supposed to be the moral standard? They were supposed to be the ethical standard, the standard of justice, but they failed to do that. In fact, they kind of they kind of surfed along and rode the wave of all these other nations doing all these terrible things and and uh, their idolatry and all that kind of stuff, right? It makes me think when people say, well, at least I don't, you know, in that sense, yeah. you're, you're judging yourself by what others do. And as long as you're not doing the bad, then you're okay. Yeah. So. We're called to a higher standard than that, yeah. right? So, it's understandable why Habakkuk is asking this question. It's understandable, right? When we see evil doers uh, flourish, it's it's easy for us to kind of put ourselves above them and ask God, "Hey, God, I'm better than them. So why is why is that guy doing better, or why is that guy allowed to hurt me when I'm more righteous than he is?" But we all know, according to Romans chapter three, we are all sinners. We all need God's forgiveness. So it, we, we ought not to think that we are in a position where we can judge other people and put ourselves on a pedestal to make that argument, right? About, hey, that guy's more evil than me, so why is he allowed to hurt me? Of course, I don't think God wants us to be hurt. Right? I don't think that's the point. I don't think God is saying that uh, I, I have willed you to suffer. I don't think that's the case. But... God does weave these different phenomena and realities, right, in our lives in order to teach us a lesson, in order to strengthen us, in order to guide us on the right path. He has tried many, 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 many centuries, <laughs> for many centuries, to get the Israelites back in line. But they have failed and failed and failed. Time and time again, they have refused. And they are really about to 
reap the, the punishment that they sow, right? Um, so let's read God's response to that in chapter 2, verse 2 through 5. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write a vision and make a plan on tablets, that he may run who that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet at an appointed time, but at this time I will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the crowd, his soul is not upright in him, but that the just shall live by his faith. Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man, and he does not stay at home. Because he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. So, basically what God is saying is um, that even the Babylonians, people like the Babylonians, are not exempt from God's justice and God's righteousness. So at the end of the day, everyone will be judged. What the important thing is, the important thing is, and that's where we get, um, that's in uh, verse 4, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Um, and that's, uh, uh, Paul references that in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Um, that's the point, and that's that's really the the I think is the main idea of Habakkuk, and the main message that God is trying to instill upon Habakkuk in explaining all of this is that it doesn't matter what is happening, who is in power, it doesn't matter what suffering or what prosperity a righteous person is experiencing, because a righteous person will always live by his faith in God. And that really shouldn't change, right? According to circumstance or situation, right? And that's that's a high calling. That is a difficult calling, but that is true, and that is how it works. So when Habakkuk asks God, "Hey, all these different terrible things are happening. The Babylonians are rising up. The Chaldeans are rising up, and 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 we're about to see great suffering. Why is this happening?" Instead of answering that with you know, all these different cogs in the wheel, or like, you know, like these, um, giving him specific information about, hey, this is the reason, here's the reason, two, three, four, five, of why this is happening. God is saying, hey, all you have to worry about is living according to your righteousness, according to, or God's righteousness, right? As long as that's true, it doesn't matter who is in power. It doesn't matter what kind of suffering there is. It doesn't matter if the Chaldeans or the Babylonians or the Persians or whoever is in power, the righteous will always live by his faith, right? And uh, and that's really the point that I think God is trying to make uh, in this conversation between Habakkuk and uh, himself. And we're going to see then later in chapter three, um, Habakkuk gets this, right? He understands, right? So in, in chapter three, at the very end. He, he rejoices in the Lord. And these are words that would be really impossible to say in such a treacherous time, right? I mean, look at the things that, that he is describing. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, pro produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. That's terrible. I mean, we're talking about livelihood without food and, and, and water and drink. Uh, flock be cut from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. We're talking about actual livelihood, right? It, this would be the equivalent of saying everyone here lost their jobs and everyone became homeless and the economy failed and all these terrible things happened where we wouldn't have the, the normal, the normalcy of life anymore. And yet, Habakkuk is able to rejoice in the Lord. Why is that? Because he learned that lesson. Right? What God is trying to convey here, back in chapter 2, is that the righteous shall always live by his faith in God. It's not about what you have. It's not about the circumstances. It's not about the situational things in life. But the constant is in God. And what connects us to God is our faith in Him. So as long as that is intact, 
that is strong, nothing else matters. Um, I kind of jumped ahead there, but. <laughs> um, so that's God's uh, second response there. And we'll move into the five woes spoken by Habakkuk in uh, verses six through the rest of the chapter. Can someone read that whole section, please? Will not all of these take up a talk song against him, even mockery and insinuations against him, and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his, for how long, and makes himself rich with loans? Will not your creditors rise up suddenly, and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will become plunder for them. Because you have looted many nations, all of the remainder of the peoples will loot you. Because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, town and all of its inhabitants. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. You have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many peoples, so you are sinning against yourself. Surely the stone will cry out from the wall, and the raptor will answer it from the framework. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that peoples toil for fire and nations grow weary for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk, so as to look on their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around you and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. For the violence done to... Lebanon will overwhelm you, and the devastation of its beasts by which you terrify them, because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town and all of its inhabitants. What profit is the idol when its maker has carved it, or an image, a teacher of falsehood? For its maker trusts in its own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. Woe to him who says a piece of, to a piece of wood, Awake, to a mute stone, Arise, and that is your teacher. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Um, this is pretty straightforward. These are woes to the specific um, things that were happening. And, you know, these are things that we have seen before in other, other books. Um, injustice, uh, unjust economics is one. Uh, that's kind of unique here. Um, uh, slavery, uh, irresponsible leaders, leadership, <coughs> and of course idolatry um, as one that's that, that kind of penetrates all of um, kind of in the center of all, all of these wrongdoings or transgressions of God's people is uh, some uh, all, most times it circles around idolatry. Uh, but these woes are, I think the important thing to get away from these, these woes uh, is that just because God um, sometimes weaves uh, evil people or evil nations or whatever in order for his will to be done, that does not mean that those standards that God has for us are just out of the window. That's not the case, right? Again, just because God let Babylon come into power and be used as a tool for uh, Israel's punishment does not mean that the people of Babylon are going to be just exempt from the standards of moral and ethics and, and justice and righteousness that God has for everyone, for all of human beings. Right. So when, when the day of the Lord comes, the capitalized day of the day, our day of the Lord comes, uh, all of those people are going to be subject. And, and, and be accountable for their actions. There are uh, a lot of people who constantly mistake the like doing well in terms of this earth, either in terms of power, in terms of wealth, or whatever. There are a lot of people who have always mistaken that for being a sign of the favor of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Just because God puts you in a position of power doesn't mean that He's favoring you, and that's repeated constantly in the Bible. I mean, we see it here in the Bible. We saw it with Pharaoh. Pharaoh is in a position of great power, but why did God put him there? To bring him down and show all the nations the power of the Lord. Yep, exactly. Um, in fact, 
tech, when you're in positions of power and wealth, you ought to be careful, even more so, because God's watching you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, and these woes are, are, are a great uh, reminder in the midst of this difficult you know, conversation between Buffy and God, uh, reminding us that, hey, yeah, you know, we can pose those questions and, and you know, God will say, hey, I, I can weave these different events in history and things like that for my will to be done, but at the same time, you ought not to forget that the standard is still there. Right? God still expects us uh, to live according to a standard of morality and ethics and justice and righteousness and all that good stuff. So, uh, and then we move on to Habakkuk's prayer finally in chapter 3. And I'll go ahead and read that real quick. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to uh, Shigianoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Grace flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations, then the eternal mountains were scattered, the everlasting hills sank low, his were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction, the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers, or your indignation against the sea, when you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows, so you split the earth with rivers, the mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. So, uh, you pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trample the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Who does that sound like that God's taught or Habakkuk is referencing? Sounds like the Exodus, right? All right. So he's making a reference to um, Exodus and, and how God crushed uh, with obviously first with the, um, uh, the the miracles, but also with um, or the plagues, and and uh, and then obviously just annihilated the the, the uh, forces, the militaristic forces of, of Egypt. Um, under the sea. Uh, and this is often used, obviously, in the Old Testament to reference um, God's deliverance and his salvation. Um, it's just a prime example of that. Um, and then we have this final prayer here uh, in uh, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce, produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. To the choir master of the stringed instruments. So, Habakkuk is just a very encouraging book. Uh, whenever you're going through hard times, and whenever you have that kind of nagging question in your heart um, regarding tough situations and, and um, his hardships, and you're questioning, you know, why is this happening, and that kind of stuff. The Habakkuk is just a great, great book to read, and to realize at the end, like Habakkuk did, that God is ultimately in power. And no matter what happens, He is in power. And what matters at the end of the day is our faith in Him. So, ran a little bolt over time, but uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 I need to bring some real food. I find that 
this for like two years and seven years. I'm beginning to wonder if they're just going to keep the ants on. Like a chili or a sandwich or a 